Welcome to Eastlake. We are an inclusive faith community dedicated to the free search for truth and meaning, seeking to live out a more just and life-giving spirituality in the modern world. We see faith as less about doctrines and dogmas demanding total agreement, but a life to be lived, enjoyed, and given away to others. What unites us is a growing awareness that life is a gift and love is the point. We welcome the entire human family, regardless of race, age, creed, physical abilities, marital or economic status, gender identity, or sexual orientation. So if you are curious and have come to see, if you are tired and have come to rest, if you are grateful and have come to share, if you are journeying and have come to grow, if you are wounded and have come to heal, if you are joyful and have come to shine, welcome home. Today, we hear from Bevan Walters as she continues our series on parenting. Please check the description for links to our quarterly Spotify playlist and guided meditation. Hi there, and welcome to part two of module four in the parenting series, the 3D Parent Model, A Simple Approach for Parenting Complex Kids. Once again, I'm Bevan Walters, Certified Parent Coach and the founder of The 3D Parent. So again, this is part two of module four, which is Parenting with Dignity and Discipline. If you haven't had a chance to watch part one yet, you're going to want to go back and do that first because I'm going to pick up right where I left off in the last section in part one, which was talking about your two essential tools in discipline, which are first, your connection with your child, that deep attachment that we talked about in module three. That is one of your discipline tools. And then the other tool, which is your authority or your power to parent, your alpha stance as a parent, the one who creates order and guides and influences and teaches and leads and sets the limits. So those are your two essential tools. Now applying that to the three phases of discipline, and that is proactive discipline, active discipline, and retroactive discipline. Going to start off first with proactive discipline. So these, of course, are the things you do to avoid conflict, to avoid power struggles, things that you do to set things up for success so that children are, are more naturally able to tap into their instincts to follow, listen, take direction from, and orient to you because of that deep connection. So the work you're doing on deepening and strengthening and securing your attachment with your child is a part of proactive discipline. So the strategies I talked about in module three do play a part in proactive discipline. And the part that I want to introduce, na introduce now is how a child might feel really deeply connected to their parent or caregiver in general, but they still sometimes struggle to listen, follow, take direction from you when you need them to cooperate and follow the agenda that needs to happen at that moment. That oftentimes indicates something going on right there in the moment. So children, once again, naturally have an instinct to, to follow, listen, and obey those to whom they feel connected to in a given moment. The in the given moment part is what I'm talking about now. So oftentimes when parents need their kids to get ready to go out the door or come to the dinner table or stop playing with a toy and go upstairs to get ready for bed and brush teeth and all of that, they do what I call parenting cold where they just give a direction. Maybe their kid is in another room playing with something and they say, hey, it's time to go out the door. Come right now, get your shoes and socks on and your coat so we can get out the door on time. <clears throat> and their kid doesn't do anything. And so then they repeat themselves and maybe they escalate and maybe they yell at their kid. And now maybe they're threatening a consequence. All the things that really are to be avoided because they're damaging to our relationships with, with our children. And it also trains them to wait until that happens to follow directions. 
So we don't wanna do that with our kids. Instead, we wanna turn on that natural instinct that already exists there. And you can do that through a strategy that's called connect before direct. There are two ways I'm going to talk about doing that. So to connect before direct is to basically turn on that relationship energy in the moment you need the cooperation. So the first way you can do that, if you have a minute or two, is to engage with your child, come into their space in a friendly way, and engage with whatever has their attention in that moment. Ask them some questions about it. Engage with them in their play for a minute or two, and then you can go ahead and direct them to what needs to happen next. That is the one version of connect before direct. So it might look like your child um, is playing with a Lego. You come into their space. Oh, you're building a Lego. What are you building? Oh, you're going to make a house. That's cool. How many stories to the house? A two story house. So after you finish the ground floor, you're going to put a second layer on top. Awesome. What pieces are you going to need for that? I'll find you a couple of them. You can do this for a minute or two until it's clear that your child is in relationship, connecting with you, engaging with you. And then you can go ahead and say, okay, we need to put that away now, but we can come back later and work on that. Let's go ahead and go get our shoes on. And then you start continuing to talk with your child and engage with them in just a conversation while they're following your lead. So that's connect before direct, option one. Option two, If you are pressed for time, you don't have that minute or two, or it just feels more your natural instinctive style, is to connect through play. Connecting with a kid through being playful is incredibly powerful because it just interrupts their focus and immediately grabs it and it takes it and orients it onto you, which is the goal here. So if your child is paying attention to something, let's go back to the Lego example, and you just kind of come into the room and you're like, Okay, I've got these shoes here. We gotta get them on. So can you please put them on your ears? What what did I just say? Put them on your ears? That's ridiculous. I didn't mean that. I meant put them on your knees. Oh, oh my gosh. I, I where do you put these? You're being playful. You're being funny. Kids eat that up, and they're like, okay, what else you got for me? They'll follow you anywhere if you continue being playful and engaging. Another example, maybe it is getting close to. Um, it is getting close to bedtime. You need a kid to go upstairs to where their bedroom is so they brush their teeth and get changed in their PJs. <clears throat> instead of just saying, time to go upstairs and get changed, instead you say, all right, let's race to the top of the stairs. Who can get there first? Ready, set, go. And you start running up the stairs with your child and then you trip or pretend to trip, I should say. And you're like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna fall. Oh, you're so fast, you're gonna beat me. Oh my gosh, look at you go. You're being silly and playful. Again, kids think that's fantastic. And they're gonna continue to follow your lead as you continue to be playful and lead them to the next thing that has to get done. Now you're in the bathroom and you hand them the toothbrush and you say, okay, I'm gonna tell you a funny joke or a riddle. And by the time you finish brushing your teeth, I want you to give me your best guess. Okay. And then you start telling the joke while they're brushing their teeth. The focus is on the engagement, not on this boring task they don't really wanna do. So you can do this connect for before direct strategy and get a lot of success in your child just naturally following you and orient to you without it being such a fight and without having to escalate. Now, a lot of times after I introduce this strategy to parents, they say, gosh, but it takes so much effort yeah, it works, but oh my gosh, it's just, it's a lot of effort to do this every time I name a kid to follow some type of direction. Well, here's the thing, no matter what it takes effort, and you could put the effort in proactively in the way I've described, which feels really fun, enjoyable, connecting in your relationship even feels a little stronger because you've got this natural instinct that you're continuing to grow in your relationship with your child, which is they're going to follow. They're going to listen, take direction from you because why would they not? It's a really pleasant experience to follow a parent who is leading with play or leading with connection. It also takes a lot of effort to say something, say it again, raise your voice, now come up with a consequence, now continue to kind of have this real abrasive tone to get your kid to do what they need to do that way. That also takes a lot of effort. But then you feel terrible, your kid feels terrible, and your relationship has been a little bit damaged in the process, meaning that it's gonna be that much less likely your child will follow you or listen to your directions next time. You've also been training your child that, oh yeah, I don't do what my parent says until they yell and scream and give a threat. That's right. 
So we don't want our kids to be defaulting to waiting for that to step into gear and follow us. No, we want them to follow and have it be a more natural thing because we're turning on that instinct ahead of time through this strategy. The other thing parents say is, oh my gosh, am I gonna do this forever? Am I going to need to go to my teenager and do this connect for direct thing? The answer is no, or at least not most of the time. We talked about the stages of attachment and how getting that deep, secure level of attachment, ideally by around the six years of life, that once that is solidly rooted and you're continuing to be engaging with your child and nurture that relationship with them, that is enough eventually to sustain you parenting cold. Meaning that when you have a 10 year old who's deeply attached and you say, time to go get your shoes on, and they just do, there wasn't a miracle that happened. You've just been turning on that instinct from a young age and nurturing a relationship with your child. They have a natural instinct to follow you once that has really, really been established. However, like I said, sometimes you may still benefit from the strategy, even with an older child, even with a tween or teen. Connect with your child, turn on their instinct to follow you, even when they are capable and have been doing so most of the time. I find that this can be really helpful at a certain time of the day, dinner time. Now, some kids, they hear it's dinner time, they run, they come because they're hungry and they want your good food. But other times, kids are just kind of in their own little world. Maybe they're deep into homework or something that has their attention and they just don't feel quite so motivated to come to dinner when you call them. You might fall into the trap of yelling, escalating, becoming really abrasive. Oh gosh, now they don't really want to come next time either. So instead, you can go ahead and come down to their room or up to their room, connect with them, engage with them, and then invite them to dinner and come along with them to dinner as opposed to kind of, all right, it's going to be dinner, dinner in a minute or two. Just kind of come with them and after connecting with them, they're going to be that much more willing and instinctively following you, even at the older ages. But in general, yes, you eventually do get to the point where you can just give an instruction, a direction, and kids will come into line because you have that solidly rooted attachment connection that is still serving you when you need them to follow your directions. Um, I'm going to move now into, there's other aspects of proactive discipline, but in a, an effort to try and get through these concepts, I'm going to give you just kind of the most essential or most beneficial tools and strategies that you can put into practice right away to try and um, have discipline with dignity and embrace this approach versus the approach that you may have used in the past. So I'm trying to give you some strategies right away that you can try since I just said, okay, don't do timeouts, don't do threats, don't do consequences, don't yell, don't threaten to leave your child, don't put them in timeout. Now I'm giving you some alternatives. So there are more things that you can do when it comes to proactive discipline. But if you focus on your relationship with your child, they're gonna already, there's already gonna be less incidences where your child isn't listening to you. And if you use this connection for a direct strategy in one of the two ways I highlighted, that's another way that you're going to um, avoid a lot of power struggles or escalations that you may be experiencing currently. Moving into active discipline. So these are the moments when you're having to set a limit, give a no, set a boundary for your child and step into your authority um, when it comes to discipline. Or it might be a moment when you're needing to intercede, when there is a problem, something that's going sideways with your child, their behavior, their actions, what they're doing. Active discipline, in the moment discipline. Uh, this active discipline, of course, part of it is to create order and part of it is for you to be the clear person who's setting the rules, the boundaries and whatnot, but it also serves another purpose, which is helping your child become more adaptive to facing life's frustrations and adapting to those frustrations, accepting those frustrations, feeling kind of the underlying feelings that come along when things don't go your way and becoming more adaptive and more resilient. This is a muscle we're building, a, be, build, the ability to be adaptive and resilient. It's a muscle that we're building within our children through our discipline. So we're practicing being the nurturing alpha both of those aspects of your role as a parent come into play when it comes to active discipline. So when children challenge us, when we um, when they want something and we have to give a no, when um, 
let's say you've put a cereal in, cereal in front of them for breakfast and they really wanted waffles and you're having to decide, okay, do I just like say, sorry, we're having cereal today or do I just go ahead, avoid that tantrum and meltdown that could happen, get rid of the cereal and give them the waffle. What do I do? I'm gonna encourage you to practice from very young and early ages or wherever you are in the process of raising your children, get into the habit of setting limits and sticking with the limits you're setting and not getting trapped by giving in once your child pitches a fit or tiptoeing around potential meltdowns or tantrums by giving yeses or adapting to your child when really you want and need to give them a no so that they are the ones that are adapting. Our children need the practice adapting. We oftentimes have been in the habit of adapting too much to them in an effort to keep the peace in the moment. And I want to encourage you to not do that anymore. Our kids need a lot of practice becoming adaptive because there are a lot of young adults who come out into the world not very adaptive not very able to handle frustrations that life hands their way, still um, wanting to blame other people for their problems or mistakes, or just not wanting to face the feelings that get stirred up when they are frustrated or when they're disappointed by a limit that they're hitting. So we have to practice from the very beginning when our children first start questioning, testing limits, or needing us to intercede or support them when they are finding something in life has issued a, a frustration, a futility, something that cannot change in their life. So this adaptive cycle is, it takes a very clear um, kind of, it takes a very clear cycle. There's a very clear kind of order in which things should happen and you have a clear role in that and your child has a clear role in that. So I wanna create clarity around what your role and your child's role is and what you do, your behaviors in helping your child become more adaptive and you being really rooted in your role as the nurturing alpha. What exactly are your marching orders? What are you doing in that moment? So you're giving a no, you're setting a limit. You're saying, no, we're having cereal today. We'll have waffles another day, but today it's cereal. You've set a limit. You've given your no. That's your job is to hold that limit and keep it clear that you're not budging, that that's what's happening today. That is what's for breakfast today. Now, your child's role is to adapt to that limit, adapt to that um, boundary that you have given them. That takes a process, the adaptive process. So the natural instinct for your child, once you've given a limit, typically is to ask again, act, ask in a different way, to negotiate. That is all indication that they don't want to adapt. They're trying to get you to change your mind so they don't have to feel the feelings that get stirred up inside of them when they are frustrated, don't get their way. Your role again, hold that boundary, hold that no. So, oh, please, can I please have, uh, just this one time, can I have waffles? Nope, sorry, you're gonna have the cereal. That's what I've put in front of you. Um, I'll give the example of a cookie because it's a simple example, but the cookie represents any type of limit that you're needing to set for your child. So that could be, yeah, what you eat for breakfast, the color cup you pour the water in, um, whether or not you can have a play date that afternoon. And also for older children, it's the, no, sorry, you can't go to the birthday party on that day. You already have signed up for soccer and you have a soccer practice that day. Or it might mean for the teenager, nope, I'm sorry, I can't let you go to that party. I know there's not gonna be any parents there supervising. I know that's really hard to hear, but I'm gonna have to say no, I'm not comfortable with you going to that party. So the cookie is any limit, any no, any um, boundary you're having to set for your child, regardless of their age. But back to the example of the cookie. So you've given the no, nope, you can't have that cookie. Well, your kid doesn't wanna accept that, and so they start negotiating. Oh, can I just have half a cookie? Can I just have a chocolate chip? Can I just have a crumb off the side? It's ridiculous, right? It's not about the cookie. It's about the fact that your child doesn't want to have to adapt and accept the fullness of 
this limit you're setting. And so they try and avoid it. Even getting a little bit of a crack in the door is good enough because then they don't have to feel sad about it. So yeah, they would even accept a chocolate chip instead of the whole cookie and be like, okay, fine, at least I won a little bit. They need clear, firm boundaries. Nope, I cannot give you something different for breakfast. Yeah, I know you wanted waffles, that's not happening today. It's okay, if you're not gonna eat your breakfast, that's too bad, you might be hungry, but I packed a good snack in your um, backpack, so you'll eat at snack time. Making it clear, their no means no. But what you also don't want to do when your child is clearly struggling managing their frustration is you don't want to make it any harder for them to face that frustration by increasing it. And that often looks like, hey, you know what? If you ask me again, you're gonna not have cereal any day this week. Sorry, you're not gonna have a waffle any day this week. If, if you don't accept the cereal this morning, I'm not gonna give you waffles for the whole week. What happened? I just increased the frustration. This also can happen when parents say, hey, you know what? I don't like the attitude you're giving me. I said no to the party, but now that you're being so rude, you're gonna be grounded and you don't get to go to another party for another month. What happened? My child was struggling to accept the frustration already in front of them and I just made it harder by layering more frustration on top. A lot of parents do that because again, they get stirred up by their child's difficulty adapting, the emotions that are expressed when that is when they're in the middle of that struggle. And so parents oftentimes want to try and stop that struggle or control the struggle by making it uh, more frustrating to try and get their kid to force them into accepting it. That doesn't help your child in the long run. Another thing parents sometimes will do is they will give in. They're kind of like adapting or rescuing their child, rescuing their child from fully adapting to the limit that has been set. Um, that also doesn't help your child. You don't wanna have any bend or any crack when you're setting these limits because the harder your child has accepting the small stakes limits in life, the more the indication is they have a lot of work to do to become more adaptive. Remember, we're building a muscle and it starts with the small things that might seem ridiculous to us. It's not ridiculous because your child needs practice and the harder time they have accepting limits, the more practice they need. But we also have to recognize again, our job is to keep our own tempers in check and not to escalate along with our child. Our role is to set the limits and our child's role is to adapt. And again, that may mean that they are going to struggle and express, have a tantrum, a meltdown, have some verbal outburst because they really don't like accepting this limit. Do not respond to what is being expressed. You can talk about that later. In the moment, your role is to hold your line. If your child starts having all of this expression and they even start acting out and saying like, oh, I hate you, you never give me anything. Control the impulse to respond to that. I give you so much, How dare? you're so ungrateful. Okay, we're falling into the trap and now we are getting distracted by the goal here, which is to help our child accept a limit. By now getting caught up in the storm of emotion. So when your child does have some type of a tantrum or expressive outburst when you are holding that limit, you can name the feeling, the, the emotion your child's experiencing. Do you remember back to the steps of emotional maturity? First, they're gonna express, then they need to make sense of this emotion that they are experiencing before they can feel. When they can feel, that's when they're going to be able to be adaptive. So your child is, I can't believe, you never give me anything I want. I, I hear what you're saying. You are really upset. I gave you a no. You wanted me to say yes, and I said no, and that is really difficult. I can tell that by you know the words you're using. I can tell this is really difficult for you. You are naming what you're seeing. Remember, name what you see. You're naming what you see. You're not taking the bait and responding to their expression of emotion when they are having a hard time adapting. You are naming the underlying emotion that is being stirred up, helping them make sense of it so that they can eventually adapt. And they eventually do, and that's the goal here. And we know that they have adapted when that energy shifts from angry, mad, ragey energy to sadness. We wanna unlock this underlying feeling that follows when a kid accepts the disappointments, the frustrations, the futilities in life. And then at that point, they'll even accept us comforting them. I know that was really hard. They were really disappointed. You wanted a yes and they gave a no. 
when we can comfort our child, we're being the nurturing alpha. We're coming alongside our child and their feelings and helping them access them. We're not shaming them or making them feel bad for having a huge meltdown over something that in our mind seems very small. That wouldn't help our child either. So we expect and accept that our child is going to have meltdowns, tantrums, expressions of frustration. Our job is to hold the limit. Their job is to work towards whatever, work through whatever it takes to adapt to it. All right, so what happens if our child does not adapt or how long does this really take? Well, sometimes parents are practicing this and they say like, well, God, how long? My kid's throwing a tantrum for 15 minutes over no cookie. I mean, at what point do they have to adapt? Well, as long as it takes your child. If it takes 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour to adapt to a no, it's just an indication of how much work, how much muscle needs to be built in being adaptive. So how much time? As long as it takes. However, sometimes kids really struggle so much with adapting and and tapping into those vulnerable feelings, so much so that they, um, instead of going from kind of the angry, mad kind of outburst, they swing over into aggression. They go into attack mode. That's a natural instinct to avoid adapting. Hey everyone, it's Kristen. Just wanted to take a moment to say thank you for tuning in. I hope that you're finding these messages helpful for you in your everyday life. Um, That's what we're trying to do here is gather around the idea that life is a gift and love is the point and let's give ourselves ways to move forward in that in our own everyday world. Um, So I wanted to take a moment to say thank you for being a part of this community. To those of you who have participated and given financially, we want to say thank you to you. Everything that we do here happens because people make contributions. People say, I value this place. I want it to exist for me and for other people and so I'm going to support it. And so we just want to say how grateful we are um, that you do that. And for those of you who maybe haven't had a chance to contribute yet, um, we would ask you to consider maybe doing so. If you find this place beneficial, if you find these messages helpful for you, then um, consider joining us in that way. You can go to eastlakecc.com to make a contribution. um, And we just always are thankful for the people who want this place to exist. So thanks again for tuning in. Let's get back to the message. I'm going to introduce kind of this model to understand what this is and how it works through a model of a traffic circle. This is something I also picked up from Dr. Gordon Newfeld's materials in um, one of his intensive courses that I took. The model of a traffic circle is really helpful in understanding the adaptive process that I've been talking about and the different phases of it and also what to do when your child goes into an aggressive attack outburst when they are unwilling or unable to adapt. So if you think at the top of the traffic circle is frustration, the disappointing thing that kind of entered into your child's experience. You've given the no, the no cookie example. The first thing that happens, enters into the traffic circle is frustration over the no cookie answer. So what happens, your child's coming around this adaptive cycle, the first thing they want you to do is to change. And sometimes we do change our mind. Some parents change a lot. Our kids, oh, please, please, okay, fine, here's a cookie, or he can find have half a cookie. Sometimes they do adapt to their child instead of having the child work on adapting to the parent, and they do change their mind, or they give in a little. All of those are things that are not allowing your child to really experience what it is to adapt to frustration. So again, we need to be really clear that we have firm boundaries, that that exit to change is not open no matter how much they negotiate, how big a fit they throw, that door to change is closed. And then what we want them to do is move along a little further in the traffic circle to the bottom exit, which is when they adapt. The mad turns to sad and nothing left to do now except for feel sad and maybe cry over this frustration, this disappointment in life. But when a child really struggles and doesn't want to accept, they sometimes will bypass that exit towards being adaptive and swing out into aggressive outbursts. So this fighting, attacking energy. Again, this is a natural response. It's a subconscious 
way the body is trying, the brain is trying to protect the child from adapting and feeling those uncomfortable, vulnerable feelings. So when a child goes into aggressive outburst mode, when they are hitting or kicking or throwing things or verbally attacking, I want you to die, I hate you, I wish you weren't my mother, I wish you weren't my father, when they're being very, very verbally aggressive, they are just indicating yet again how difficult it is for them to adapt to the limit you have set. Now, what happens often is parents get really, really kind of wrapped up in that energy and they start responding to it with, um, you know, now issuing consequence. Well, gosh, now that you're hitting, you're going to, you're going to lose screen time tomorrow. Well, gosh, now that you've, you've, you've uh, started to throw things around your room, you're not going to have any more play dates. They try to get a handle of the aggression by punishing the aggression or responding to it. Again, when you do that, you're not giving your child a chance to actually adapt. So what do you do instead? It's okay to go ahead and address the aggression and hold hands if they're hitting, take away something that's getting thrown, but that is a very brief temporarily pass before you're going to reroute them around the traffic circle back to reminding them of the frustration the thing that they're needing to adapt to so it's that might sound like i'm going to hold your hands i'm not going to let you hit i understand you're having a really hard time with me saying no cookie right now that's really hard for you you basically say you're having a hard time with this but i'm going to remind you of it so you have another opportunity to adapt to this thing that's really difficult for you you're rerouting your child around the traffic circle so they have another chance at adapting now you might do this repeatedly and your child is still not adapting so back to the question of how long do i do this well, ideally till your child adapts, but if this is really difficult or you're out of time or patience or it's been going on for an hour and a half and it's your child is still not getting to those um, underlying feelings, the sadness, they're not turning from mad to sad, it is okay on occasion to kind of distract and be like, I just forgot. I was going to do this really fun art project. Should we go do that right now? So you don't want to do this all the time because this is so essential. If I haven't made that clear enough, that our children become more adaptive. But once in a while, if it seems like it's not happening, your child is not tapping into those underlying feelings, maybe they can't in that moment. There'll be another opportunity soon again. But again, that's even more of an indication of how much practice they need. Another point to that is a lot of times parents think, I'll choose my battles. Fine, I'll give in on the cereal, I'll toss that out and I'll give them the waffles because it's a small stakes thing and I don't want to have a big meltdown first thing in the morning. I'll wait till it's a bigger issue. That is a misstep, particularly with children who really struggle facing the frustrations or limits because if you're just waiting for the bigger stakes limits, even less of a chance they're going to be able to adapt and handle that limit because it's a bigger stakes limit. So do start with the smaller limits. Do hold the line, even though yes, you could just dump out the cereal and give the waffle. How difficult really is that to adapt to our child and their demands? Well, it's a problem because it sets a precedent of not being able to adapt. And also start, it flips the tables on who's in charge. If a child demands something and we're adapting to them, it's the wrong order. We need children to be adapting to us and our limits. So that is the ad adaptive cycle in a nutshell. Um, I'm going to move on to the other way in which we as parents are helping, are responding when there's active discipline occurring. And that is when there's an incident, something has happened and you need to intercede. What do we do in those moments? Well, oftentimes parents put their focus on um, controlling the child's behaviors. They go right to, to stop doing that, giving warnings, or saying, if you keep doing that, I'm going to take that away. Or um, if you guys are fighting like that, then you're going to be in time out. We're talking about the behaviors and we're trying to focus the behaviors and influence the behaviors by going right at them. That is a problem. It leads to a lot of frustration because ultimately we can't control our child's behaviors. Sometimes it seems like we can when we give a threat or a consequence, maybe in that moment we can get some type of a response. But again, that's very surface level um, 
controlling behaviors is very surface level. We want to actually go deeper. So we want to instead not get into the habit of trying to control our child's behaviors and instead control things that really are in our control. And I call this the three do's of incident management. So there's something happening, you need to intercede. The three do's. Well, the first thing you have control of is yourself. So your emotional response, your, the way in which you're going to um, intercede with whatever is going sideways in your home, you can control yourself. So first and foremost, you're gonna temper your emotional response to whatever's happening. And the first, do, the first do of the three do's of incident management, you're going to do no harm. So it's better to do nothing in a moment than to do something that's gonna cause harm to your relationship with your child. So do no harm. Control yourself and your response. Take a deep breath and then go into the second do of the three do's of incident management. The second do is do take charge of the circumstances. It's not taking charge of the child's behaviors, it's of the circumstances surrounding your child. So get out of the habit of giving warnings and uh, that's an invitation for a power struggle. Your child now is in the power position. They get to decide if they're going to um, comply or not comply. They're testing, oh, they give a warning. Is, is, is my mom actually gonna follow through with that warning? Hmm, this is kind of interesting. I, let's see what happens. When we are going after the behaviors, the child is in the power position. They are the one that gets to decide what they're gonna do with their behaviors. You're not actually in control. What can you control? The circumstances. So that means if things are going sideways and you're at the park, we're leaving the park. If you're in the grocery store and your kid is pitching a fit because you won't buy um, a candy when you don't wanna buy a candy, you leave the grocery store, you abandon the cart. When your child is um, you know, fighting with their sibling at the dinner table, you change the seats that they're sitting in. When the siblings are fighting, we're gonna separate right now and go to different areas. You're controlling the things you can control. Um, which are oftentimes the environments, like we're gonna go over here instead. It might be um, also if a toy is being played with inappropriately, I'm gonna take this away and put it up here. We'll try again later. To take charge of circumstances in a way that doesn't sound like punishment or doesn't sound like uh, going after the behaviors, I'm going to give you this really wonderful catch-all phrase that you can say when you're going to take charge. And that is the phrase, this isn't working. So let's say you're at the park, things are going sideways, your kid's getting into fights with another kid over the swing. Hey, you know what, this isn't working right now, we're gonna leave the park. This isn't working, nobody's in trouble, no one is to blame, it's just this isn't working. Similarly, the siblings are fighting over the same toy. You know what, this isn't working right now. We're gonna go into separate areas to play. It's not working to play together right now. We'll try again later. You're taking charge of what you need to take charge of, the circumstances, and you're doing so in a way that doesn't feel punitive. Now, keep in mind, I've talked about how um, punishments, sometimes we call them consequences when they're issued like, oh, because you did that, you lost dessert tonight. That's a, um, a consequence that you've kind of pulled out of thin air and you've used as a way to punish your child about some behavior they had. There is absolutely a time and place for natural consequences. And that's what we're talking about here. These circumstances really are natural consequences. Hey, this isn't working right now. We're gonna do something else. That's a natural consequence for what was happening. It doesn't mean now I'm gonna go tell you how your behavior was so terrible and that's what led to leaving. It's just, oh, it looks like you're having a hard time in the grocery store with me saying no. We're gonna go ahead and leave right now. This isn't working. Oh, this isn't working to be, uh, you know, both on, uh, both wanting to be on uh, the same bicycle. We only have one bicycle. It's not working to uh, be taking turns the bicycle. We'll try again another time when we're able to figure out a way that we can take turns. This isn't working right now. We'll try again later. So this isn't working is a great catch-all way to take charge. And that is where I want to encourage you to do that. Get out of the habit of giving warnings. That is, again, an invitation for a power struggle to step in and take charge. Now, when you do this, your kids might say, wait a minute, you didn't give us a warning or give us another chance. Again, that's an indication that your kids need practice at kind of adapting to your authority. Yeah, I know I didn't give a warning, but it wasn't working, so we're gonna do something else now. 
Um, the other thing, sorry, the third do of the three do's of incident management is you do buy yourself time. So I'm not saying never address problematic behavior, just not in the moment. In fact, in the moment is typically the worst time to address the problem that was taking place. Yeah, there was something going on at the park. Your kid was fighting over the swing set with another kid. You do want to talk about that. Now is not the time. So you're going to buy yourself some time and talk about it later. You told your, you, you gave your kid um, a limit. They didn't like it. They threw a huge fit. Yeah, I know this is really hard for you to handle. We'll talk about it more later. You're buying yourself time to discuss it at a time when tempers have gone down and your child is actually able to talk about something without getting super um, tied up in their emotions surrounding it. So you do buy yourself time. So once again, those three do's of incident management, do no harm, do take charge of the circumstances, and do buy yourself time. And that leads right into the final phase of discipline, which is retroactive discipline. So this is you've bought yourself time, now you're going to talk about something that happened that was problematic. So retroactive discipline is um, when you're going to go and you're going to revisit something, a problem, um, maybe it was a particular incident or maybe a reoccurring thing that you've been observing that you want to address. I call this the circle back. This is when you're going to circle back and address something that happened in the past, maybe earlier that day, maybe a couple of hours ago, maybe even a couple of days ago. It doesn't have to be right in the moment. You have to get enough time. You need to buy yourself enough time that tempers have calmed down. There's no more frustration that you can feel and within the context of connection. So a moment when you feel connected with your child, you've moved on, you just had a really nice cuddle, sitting on the bed, reading stories together, and now you're gonna revisit this. Older child, you know, some time has gone by, your kid had a really strong reaction to something earlier, lashed out, you wanna go back and revisit that later, not in the moment when they have all that heightened emotion. So you go into their room, you sit in the bed, you kind of talk a little bit about their day, what's going on, and now you're going to circle back and address. This is the retroactive discipline piece. So the first thing that you wanna do with this circle back strategy is you start off always by taking responsibility for anything that you need to. If you have an apology that you need to give, any amends, you do that very first. So despite our best intentions, sometimes we do yell. Sometimes we do say something mean or hurtful. If you have done so, you always start the circle back with, I want to talk about what happened earlier. I owe you an apology. I'm really sorry for yelling at you. I'm really sorry for saying that you're thoughtless. I'm really sorry for saying that you're ungrateful. You didn't deserve the yelling. You didn't deserve for me to say that about you. I'm really sorry. Period. You don't go on to say, but you were really out of line, but your behavior was really awful, but you were really being difficult all day long and I finally had it. No, that justifies your behavior. And the thing that you need to do right now is make amends and take responsibility for your actions. The things that you do, that gut check, and you're like, mm, I overstepped the line, I was hurtful. This is what you do first. But then you don't go around and force an apology out of your child. Your job here is to take the lead in your relationship with your children. Remember, you're the alpha, the nurturing alpha. So if there's a repair that needs to be made, you're going to take the lead in that. And then after you apologize, if there's an apology that is owed, you can say, do you accept my apology or is there anything you wanna say about what I said? Now your child may just accept your apology, which is great. They may even naturally go into their own apology. That's also wonderful. You just don't wanna force it because then we're not giving the opportunity for your child to build the capacity to feel remorseful to feel a sense of, mm, I did something wrong and I wanna take ownership over it. I have a sorry to give. I wanna take responsibility for my actions. We want that to grow naturally within our kids. When we force apologies, they don't do that. Then we're just forcing for them to perform as if they're sorry and not to actually be sorry. And we want the actual authentic sorry to grow inside our kids. The second thing you do after you've apologized or in cases when you actually didn't do anything that you need to take responsibility and apologize for. You don't need to apologize for your authority. You don't need to apologize when you have said, not okay, here's your limit, and we're really strong and um, firm in holding the boundary. There's nothing to apologize for. You also don't wanna apologize for your child being upset when you set that limit because if that limit was something you need to set, don't apologize for it. That is 
your authority and your role. So if there's no apology that you need to give to your child, then instead you kind of launch into this next step or right after you give apology when you do need to do so. The second step in this circle back is to talk about the behaviors of the problem, but you do so in a way where you're not going to go directly at the bad behavior and lay it out for your child and give a lecture on their bad behavior and why it was bad and make them feel covered in a blanket of shame. Instead, you're going to talk about their good intentions, how you know that they know better, but they just couldn't execute that in that moment. Um, Dr. Neufeld calls this soliciting good intentions. So solicit the good intentions that children have, they're good. They just can't always um, live up to their good intentions. So that might sound like, you know what? I know when you were, you know, throwing things after me, throwing things at me when I said no cookie. I know you knew it's not okay. You know it's not okay to throw things at me. I know you know it's not okay to be aggressive or hurtful. You just were really upset that moment, and you got you lost control. But you know it's not okay to throw things at people. Notice I'm still mentioning the behavior. I'm still talking about the fact it's not okay, but the reality is your kid already knows it's not okay. It's not a matter of you haven't taught them enough times that it's not okay to be aggressive or hurtful. It's not, um, when you go back and you circle back and you talk about something that happened, you know, I know you know it's not okay to take something from your sister without asking. You know that you should have asked for it first before um, going into her room and getting a sweatshirt out of her drawer. You know better, you know it's, it, you should always ask first. You just didn't do it that time, you made a mistake. That's okay, you're not gonna do it again. I'm gonna help you make things right. So you're soliciting good intentions. You're talking about the problematic behaviors, but by saying, you know better, that's not who you are. You're this really good person who made a mistake. That is very different than saying, you made a mistake, you made a bad choice, you did something wrong. Shame, shame, shame. Your child right now feels very bad about themselves. Their esteem is lowered, and they start to think of themselves as a bad kid who does bad things versus a good kid who made a mistake. And that's where we want them to be operating from because that's gonna build that positive self, sense of self-worth. That's going to build their desire to wanna to live up to their good intentions that you have already laid out in front of them is what they're capable of. And a uh, last step of this that you don't always need to, not every situation calls for it, is to do some problem solving. So let's say um, you have uh, two siblings and the example I just gave, uh, you have two sisters and one sister snuck into her older sister's room and uh, took a sweatshirt that belonged to the older sister and wore it without asking. So you've talked through this, you have solicited good intentions, you've said, I know you know better, you didn't mean to, you, you didn't, um, you just got too tempted. That's not who you are, you know it's not okay, you should always ask first. Now we go into problem solving mode. What do you think you can do to make things right? This is an invitation for them to take responsibility for their mistakes. When we tell them what they're gonna do to make it right, it feels like a punishment. You're gonna write an apology to your sister and you're gonna give her that note tonight and you're gonna give it to her and say these things. Well, gosh, now it's not authentic. Now it actually is not coming from this internal place that we want it to be coming from within our children, which is for them to grow the capacity for feeling remorseful over their mistakes and taking responsibility for their actions. So you partner with your child, you come alongside them and say, okay, you made a mistake. We make mistakes sometimes. We're gonna problem solve and figure out how to fix this. What do you think you can do to make things right. So that might be an example when maybe there's been an incident between siblings or between friends or maybe between your child and their teacher. You need to help them make things right. Or if it's like, okay, there always seems to be a problem when I set the limit and it's the end of, you know, we only get half hour of screen times on school nights and you still are having a hard time accepting that limit. Let's come up with a plan because I know you mean to to um, meet the expectations. I know you mean to um, accept the rule that I have set upon you, uh, that I have set up for our family. You want to live up to that rule. It's just really hard. Let's come up with a plan and figure out how we can make this a little easier. Oh, I know. Let's set um, that timer on your iPad before you go on it so that when that timer goes off, you know you have only five minutes left. Let's try that strategy. Let's see if that works better. That is collaborative problem solving. Take your child's input. You can make some suggestions, come up with a plan together. That is this whole process, this uh, retroactive discipline is really walking your child through the process of being reflective, which if you recall is that 
uh, most mature stage of emotional development, the ability to look back and reflect upon um, things that have happened and repair, to make goals, to do better next time is all part of that reflective process. So you walk your child through that process when they're young and still developing and help them become more reflective by making it easier to do so. This is the conclusion of this 3D parent model series. I hope you've been inspired to apply the 3D model approach in your parenting, what we've covered during these four modules, and that that is helping you feel more empowered in your parenting and more like you're on your way to become the expert for your children. I want to leave you with a message of encouragement and empathy Parenting is this incredible journey, and it can really bring up for us a lot of our own mixed feelings. Um, yes, some of those are beautiful joy and pride in our children in this capacity for love that we didn't even know we were capable of. But also alongside that is feelings that we have about our inadequacy or guilt or regret or frustration about why it's so hard and why we're having such a difficult time at periods of time with our children. Just know that you have it within you. Trust yourself. Trust your children. Know that you're exactly who your child needs, that you are their answer and you have it within yourself to provide exactly what your children require to grow and mature and flourish. Thanks so much for watching this 3D Parent model series. Um, if you are interested in finding out more, I encourage you to explore what else the 3D Parent has to offer as far as the membership community, as far as um, the 3D Parent podcast, or opportunities to work with me one-on-one -on -one in possibly doing some parent coaching. Take care. Thank you for joining us. To make a donation, head to eastlakecc.com slash donate.